Hi everyone, it's Roisin from Curiodicy, and today I have a special guest here that's going to help us learn about one of my favorite types of animals. Do you want to meet him? This is Linguini. He's my snake, and he's a Kenyan sand boa. I'll tell you more about Kenyan sand boas in a little bit. Today we want to explore all about snakes because Snakes are amazing. Even though I know some people say they don't like snakes, um, snakes are a big group of animals. There are more than 3,000 species of snakes in the world, and really only about 7% of them, not very many, are potentially harmful to people. All snakes have a really important role to play in our ecosystem. So today, we're gonna learn a little bit about what makes a snake a reptile. We're gonna do an experiment to learn a little bit more about why snakes have scales. We'll even get to watch Linguini here eat his lunch and learn a little bit about how they can eat such big things. So let's do it. Linguini is a Kenyan sand boa. He's about eight years old and I say he, I'm only pretty sure he's male or a boy. Snakes actually have their differences on the insides of their bodies, so I can't really tell for sure. But it's a pretty good guess because he's kind of small, and male snakes tend to be smaller than female snakes. Out in the wild, Kenyan sand boas live in deserts in eastern Africa, and they usually, out in the wild, live to be 15 or 18, and in captivity, living with people, they can live a lot longer than that. Kenyan sand boas are one of the only snakes that makes its own burrows. Most snakes just take over holes in the ground that were dug by things like mice. But Kenyan sand boas, they have this amazing little shovel nose that lets them burrow down into sand. They spend most of their time underground, and I definitely see that with, with Linguini. Sometimes they'll even sit with their head just poking out of the sand so that they can see things that are walking by. And that's how they hunt. But we'll get back to that later. First, I want to tell you a story. I mentioned that snakes are a really important part of our ecosystem. And I actually have a good story about that to help you understand why. So way back when I was in college, I always liked to have chocolate on hand. And I lived with roommates and we each had our shelf for our food. And one day, you know, I'd had a long day at school and I came home and I just needed a piece of chocolate. So I went into my cabinet and took out my bar of chocolate and found that a mouse had been chewing on my bar of chocolate, which meant I couldn't eat it. So I thought, Ugh threw away my bar of chocolate, and next time I was at the store, I just bought another one. Uh, another day goes by, you know, had a long day, ready to reward myself with chocolate and go to get it, and you got it. The new bar had been eaten by a mouse also. This happened three or even four times. This mouse was literally skipping over all of my roommate's food and going straight for my bar of Cadbury's chocolate. How does this relate to snakes? Well, a lot of snakes eat small rodents, things like mice. And by doing that, they make sure that there are too many mice around. If there were too many mice around, then they start to look for new sources of food like Roisin's Cadbury's chocolate bar. So thanks snakes for helping to keep my Cadbury safe. All right, so snakes are a kind of reptile. Reptiles are found all over the world. In fact, there are reptiles on every continent except for one. Can you guess? Reptiles are not found on Antarctica because it's too cold. There are many different types of reptiles in the world and they're kind of organized into four groups. The first group is snakes and lizards. The second group is crocodilians, like alligators and gharials. The third is turtles, which includes tortoises. 
And the last one is something called a tuatara, which looks a lot like a lizard, but it's not a lizard and it's only found in New Zealand. What makes a reptile a reptile? Well, there are a bunch of things that all reptiles have in common. And one of them is that they are all vertebrate animals. Have you heard the word vertebrate before? What do you already know about it? Vertebrates are animals that have a spine or a backbone. When people see snakes moving, they're so bendy that a lot of people assume that snakes don't have bones. But they do have bones, and actually they have a lot of the same bones that humans have. And that includes a spine, which makes them a vertebrate animal. Humans are also vertebrate animals. You can feel your own backbone or spine if you just kind of tilt your head forward and feel behind your neck. Do you feel those bumps? That's your spine. You're a vertebrate. So if a lot of animals are vertebrates, then what makes reptiles special? One of the main things is what's covering their skin. Can you think what covers a reptile's skin? Reptiles' bodies are covered in scales. The scales are made out of a protein called keratin, which is the same material that makes up your fingernails. If you feel your own fingernail, you can kind of get an idea of what a snake feels like, smooth and slippery and dry. It is true that snakes shed their scales. This is actually one of Linguini's sheds, and they do come off, usually, in one big long piece like this. The other shed I have here is from a corn snake. This is a great way to get an up-close look at the shape of the scales. You can see that the scales on the back all tend to be kind of round and clustered together. The scales on a snake's belly have a really different shape. They're kind of like long bars and they're really good at gripping the ground. And that helps snakes to move without hands and feet. One of my favorite things to notice on a snake shed is the eye scale. If you've ever tried to have a staring contest with a snake, you have probably lost miserably. Snakes don't blink because they don't have eyelids. So pr to protect their eyes, instead, they have a clear scale that covers their eye and it gets shed just along with the rest of the scales. This little shed is a Kenyan sand boa, a type of boa constrictor. When I say boa constrictor, I know a lot of people picture really big snakes, but there are actually about 80 species of boas in the world, and some of them are really small like this sand boa, and some of them are quite a bit bigger. This larger shed is from a common boa constrictor. They live down in South America, and they can get up to about 10 feet, maybe sometimes a little bit bigger. When I look at a snake shed up close, it always reminds me of plastic and plastic and snake scales actually can act kind of the same way with water. This is, by the way, a video of Linguini's shed underneath a microscope, pretty cool. Snake scales do not let water in or out. And that's important because they don't drink water often. And so the water that's inside of their body is really important and they don't wanna lose it. Do you lose water through your skin? You sure do when you sweat, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. I want to set up an experiment to learn a little bit more about how this works. You can try this experiment at home. All you need is a couple of small containers, a marker so that you can mark your water level, some water, and a rubber band, or a couple rubber bands really, and I'm going to use a measuring cup. You want to start by putting exactly the same amount of water in each of your containers. I'm going to use a quarter cup. And then you can also mark your water level just to remind you where it started. Then take some plastic wrap or a plastic bag or something and put it over the top of one of the containers and secure it with a rubber band. Do the same thing with a piece of paper towel. And then Leave the last one uncovered as a control where you don't really change anything at all, just to make sure what you did change actually made the difference. 
Then we just wait and we see what happens to the water in the containers. What do you predict? What do you guess might happen? All right, it's day four of this experiment, so I have given it several days, and I can definitely notice a difference. Let me show you. If we take a closer look, you can see that the water levels are all different, which is pretty cool. Take a look at this one, which we didn't cover with anything. A significant amount of water evaporated. Then if we take a look at the one that we covered with a paper towel, you can see that a little bit of water did evaporate. Now let's check out the one that was covered in plastic. That water level looks exactly the same. The reason that this works is because yes, water does evaporate, it turns into a gas, but that gas can't pass through everything. In the container with nothing covering it, when the water evaporates, the water vapor, the gas easily escapes and the water level drops. In the container that is covered with a paper towel, the water evaporates, turns into a gas. Some of it can pass through the paper towel, but not very quickly. And so it doesn't evaporate quickly and the water level only dropped a little bit. Then if we look at the one that was covered in plastic, the water did evaporate and it couldn't escape. None of it could pass through the plastic. And so instead it just condensed, turned back to water as little water droplets on the plastic and dripped back down into the container. And so the water level didn't change. Now, I know that plastic is not exactly the same as scales. But I think that this experiment nicely illustrates that water vapor, evaporating water, can pass through some things and not others. And snakeskin is a lot more similar to this plastic wrap than to the paper towel. So snakeskin, remember, holds in water, doesn't let the water escape from the snake's body, which is important because they don't drink water very often. The paper towel is more like human skin. Remember, you leak. When you're hot, water passes through your skin and evaporates to help cool you down. You sweat. And that is one of the ways that you can regulate your body temperature and kind of keep it about the same no matter where you are, which is different than a snake, which doesn't sweat and can't regulate its own temperature. Its body is just whatever temperature it is wherever it is. And remember, please do try this at home. Another important characteristic of all reptiles is that they are ectothermic. You've probably heard this called cold-blooded before. I don't love to use that word because it makes people feel like snakes are cold all the time. Their bodies aren't necessarily cold all the time. All that it means is that they don't make their own body heat. So their body is going to be whatever temperature they're in. That's very different from animals like us, mammals. We are endothermic. We do make our own body heat and we kind of keep our bodies about the same temperature all the time, no matter where we are. Let's test that theory. So I like to save energy by keeping most of my house pretty cool during the day. So right now, if we check the thermostat, it's about 60 degrees in here. It's pretty cold. I feel cold. Uh, but I want to find out what happens if we actually take my temperature and see how warm the inside of my body is right now. Ninety seven point two. Welcome to warm room when I am here working during the day. We and the pups, we kind of huddle into this room. We turn on an electric heater so that we don't have to waste so much energy. So in here right now in warm room, it's probably at least 10 degrees warmer than it is downstairs. So let's see if my internal temperature, the temperature inside of my body changes when the room temperature changes. All right, we got 97.4. That is pretty close.
So even though I changed rooms and the air temperature raised 10 degrees, my body temperature only raised 0.2 degrees. That's because my body regulates my own internal temperature. I don't have a little tiny snake thermometer, so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. If I had Linguini out here in the cold where it's 60 degrees for a long time, eventually his whole body would cool down to about, you guessed it, 60 degrees. Linguini here definitely wouldn't appreciate it if I kept him out long enough for his body to drop all the way down to 60 degrees. Out in the wild, Kenyan sand boas live in pretty hot places. And so inside of his tank, I have a lot of things that help him to stay warm since his body doesn't make its own body heat. So I've got a nice hot heat lamp. I even have a heat pad underneath. And that keeps his tank in different places between 80 and 90 degrees. And that means when he's home, that his body is about 80 or 90 degrees. And that's how he likes it. I don't know about you, but I eat a lot. I kind of feel like I'm always eating, snacking on something or other. And you know what? Humans do need to eat a lot because a lot of the food we eat turns into energy that we use to heat our bodies. Since snakes don't need to heat their bodies, they don't eat very often. For example, Linguini here, I give him a mouse, a small mouse, once a week. But out in the wild, if food was scarce, a Kenyan sand boa could go a full year without eating anything. Since snakes don't need energy to heat their bodies, they really don't need to eat very often. So when they do eat, they eat big things. So we can watch a kind of sped up and shortened version of Linguini eating his lunch a few weeks ago. Check it out. What do you notice about how his mouth is opening to eat the mouse? Watch how his bottom jaw moves here. Just removing some wood shavings I don't want him to eat. See how wide he's opening his mouth? Snakes can actually eat things that are about two or three times bigger than their head. That's crazy. That would be like me trying to eat this kickball for dinner. And no, I'm not allowed to use a fork and knife because snakes don't have hands and they certainly don't have a fork and knife. They swallow their food whole, which obviously I can't do. And that's because the way that our head and our jaws are built and even the whole rest of our bodies is totally different than how snakes are built. For example, if you take your hand and you feel right in front of your ear and open and close your mouth, do you feel the clicking there? That is your jaw joint. And we only have one jaw joint on each side. If you feel your chin right here, you can feel that this is all one bone. You have one lower jaw bone. Humans only have two bones in their heads. You've got your skull, your brain helmet, and your jaw, which is all one piece. But snakes, they have five bones. They still have their brain helmet, their skull, but then they have two lower jaw bones that are separated at the chin. And the snake jaw has two joints that are separated by a bone called the quadrate bone that we don't have in our head. And since they have those two separate joints, they can open really, really wide. All right, let's watch one more feeding so you can look for some of those structures. Both of these feedings were super sped up, by the way. It usually takes him almost 15 minutes to eat. You 
you can actually build a really simple model of a human jaw and a snake jaw to be able to kind of touch this and play around with it and see how it works. All you need are about five pencils and three rubber bands. First, take two pencils and kind of cross them so one is on top of the other. Then you want to take your rubber band and stretch it over the X like this. Then you just take your rubber band and kind of twist it around a lot of times to make that pretty tight. It should end up looking like this. So you can kind of move the two pencils closer and further apart and the rubber band kind of stretches. To make your next one, you're going to do something pretty similar, except you're going to use three pencils this time. So you're going to take two pencils at first and just connect them the same exact way that you did the other ones. Then you just attach a third pencil to the other side of one of your pencils. So you kind of end up with a rectangle that's open on one side. Can you guess which one is supposed to be like a human jaw and which one is supposed to be like a snake jaw? The one that I made with regular yellow number two pencils is like a human jaw. It only has one joint and that only moves a certain amount. So you can open and close it just like you can open and close your mouth. The one with three pencils is more like a snake jaw because it has that extra quadrate bone and two joints. To help you understand how these pencil models fit into the head of a human or a snake, I made these, let's be honest, pretty creepy cardboard faces. So I can attach them to the jaw and show you how they work. So like I mentioned, the human jaw only has that one hinge point, so it just opens and closes, like opening and closing your mouth. The snake has that extra bone, which means it has two different joint areas and can open its mouth a lot wider. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up. A snake is a type of reptile, and reptiles are vertebrates with backbones. They have scales covering their bodies that help them to hold water in their bodies and they are ectothermic or cold-blooded. They don't make their own body heat. On top of that, I didn't mention that all snakes have some type of egg development, but that is a whole nother complex and fascinating story. You can actually check out one of our other videos, Exploration, to learn more about eggs. All right, thanks so much for joining us, me and Linguini. We hope you had a super time. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Um, and we hope that you keep exploring and we hope to see you again soon.